then there is the steel bearing the name cop standing between the paws of this thing's itself figure 77. This Gretna steel was erected to commemorate restoration work that was done on the monument by King Thutmose IV sometime between 1425 and 1417 PC. That this single syllable of Kaf that appears on the steel should give Egyptologists reason to believe Kafra was the builder is somewhat bizarre because the very same steel also describes the entire Giza necropolis as being a splendid place of the first time which of course associates the whole complex a far earlier epoch in Egypt's history. There is also another steel at Giza called the Inventory Steel which mentions Khufu building the temple and also mentions the Great Pyramid as being next to the Sphinx, which also indicates that both the Sphinx and the Pyramid were already there before Khufu's time. Naturally, Egyptologists have branded the Inventory Steel as a forgery because it is contrary to the Orthodox theory, though they neglect to indicate who they think may have forged a 4500-year-old stone steel or why. This same extraordinary approach has been seen with other steel as well, as in the case of the king list in which the bottom half of the list is said and has been proven to be genuine but the top half is said to be either a forgery or mythology. Or mistaken. One of the main anchor points for the theory that Khufu was the builder the Great Pyramid lies with an inscription bearing his name that was bound in a small antechamber within the pyramid that had long been sealed. This inscription was seized upon as proof but has always been highly suspect and has been now confirmed as a forgery yet it is still used to validate the theory. The story of the inscription goes like this. In 1837 a man by the name of Colonel Howard Bees and two companions claimed to have bound the remains of the pharaoh Menkura inside the smaller Giza pyramid thus proving at last who built it. However the real fact of the matter is that the money was a fraud consisting of a 2,000-year-old coffin and some bones from the Christian era which had been assembled into a fraudulent discovery. This fact is widely known by scholars and cannot be disputed by anyone yet it is almost never publicized. The fact that the inscription found inside the antechamber of the Great Pyramid was also found by Colonel Bees in the same year should immediately give one pause, and yet we find that this fact is absolutely never publicized. Why? The forgery of the inscription has actually now been positively confirmed by the great grandson of a man who witnessed the actual event. The suspect nature of the inscription was mentioned by the Sumerian scholar Zelpariah Sitchin in his book The Stairway to Heaven. The reader of the book then wrote to Sitchin confirming the forgery which he reported on in a later book entitled The Wars of Gods and Men in which he says. At the end of 1983. The reader of that book came forward to provide us with family records showing that his great-grandfather, the master mason named Tom Freeze Brewer, who was engaged by these to help use gunpowder to blast his way inside the pyramid, was an eyewitness to the forgery. And, having objected to the deed, was expelled from the site and forced to leave Egypt altogether. It is therefore somewhat strange that still in 2006 any book on the Giza complex you may pick up released by mainstream academia still states that the smaller Giza pyramid was built by the pharaoh Menkura even though the fraud was exposed almost immediately is widely known about. It is interesting that smooth-sided square-based pyramids were never part of ancient Sumerian construction yet Sitchin also offers us pictorial evidence in the form of 6,000-year-old Mesopotamian clay tablets clearly depicting the smooth-sided square-based pyramid during construction figure 78A and celebrations after its completion. Figure 78B and 1 clearly depicting the serpent symbol of the Sumerian god in key figure 78C presenting us with further proof that the monuments were known to the ancient Sumerians of 6,000 years ago and of their far greater antiquity than is currently theorized. There is also documented evidence in 6,000-year-old Sumerian texts which mention the construction of an abode called the An which translates as house that like the mountain is and describes how the structure was eventually abandoned due to a conflict and had its capstone removed. These texts also mention the hurried hacking of an emergency shaft to rescue someone imprisoned inside the end. Here by huge sliding stones, which adequately explains three enigmas of the Great Pyramid all in the one text. Clearly, if the pyramid was not known to the ancient Sumerians as we are told then they could not possibly be in possession of such accurate information that is also so unique to the structure.
in the extremely well-researched book A Keeper of Genesis released in 1996. The authors John Hancock and Robert Bovell present strong evidence to support the theory that the Sphinx was not built in the image of Khafra. In the book, Hancock and Bovell even go so far as to employ the services of a forensic scientist who specializes in face recognition to compare the two faces. His comparison shows undeniable discrepancies between the two and also punches some more serious holes in the Sphinx's Khafra theory. The two authors also present a very solid case in regards to dating the entire complex by examining the work of John Anthony West which raises serious geological questions about the entire Giza complex. In West's excellent book The Serpent in the Sky he also questions the alignments of the monuments, suggesting that these alignments were in no way incidental but rather, they held very significant and easily confirmable astronomical implications. This is an issue that was also raised in Robert Bovell's book The Orion Mystery. But in The Keeper of Genesis, and against a torrent of opposition from the academics, the authors have also put forth another bold theory that not only is the face on the Sphinx not that of Khafra, but based on overwhelming geological evidence, the Sphinx is in fact, much older than even the Great Pyramid. The date or not the date. The work done by West and Shock and the claims made by Hancock and Bovell in The Keeper of Genesis at once produced a veritable storm of criticism from the academic community. The notion that someone who held no doctorate or war degree would dare to present such an absurd theory infuriated them. They flatly proclaimed the authors to be wrong and refused to speculate any further on the possibility that the Sphinx was not Khafra. They bluntly dismissed the idea of the Sphinx being older than the Great Pyramid as ridiculous and I believe, also banned the entire party from further access into the Giza complex to conduct any more investigations. It is an interesting thing that any investigative team that tries to present a different theory on the Giza complex to that which is put forth by the general academic community is subsequently banned from further access to the site by the Society of Egyptologists. It doesn't sound like they feel very secure in their convictions and really don't want people messing around with the facts. Science is supposed to involve conclusions that are reached through the rational investigation of all of the theories and all of the evidence, not conclusions arrived at through the blind assumption of one theory as fact. No theory should ever be placed in a position where it is no longer open for debate, especially one so loosely based on circumstantial evidence and pertaining to a site of such significance that is still so full of mystery. But, unfortunately, in blatant disregard for the true advancement of genuine scientific research, the Society of Egyptology is quite at command about panning anyone with a new theory that doesn't quite fit with their own. It seems that they are quite intent on keeping the real truth about the Giza complex very tightly under wraps indeed. It's very difficult to understand how this type of attitude and behavior could be construed as an intelligent or scientific approach to solving the issue in any way and the reasons they may have for doing this will be discussed later. But for now, the relevant authorities simply say, The debate is closed because we already know, and can prove, who built them. This is of course a statement of either pure stupidity or blatant deception because as we have already shown, it is an assumption based on very thin circumstantial evidence. If the truth be known, there is a far greater amount of much more conclusive evidence to dispute not only the theory, but that actually proves that Khufu and Khufu were in fact, not the builders. The problem that the authorities faced with is this. If Khufu and Khufra did not build them then who did? No one can show who it actually may have been. The authorities also refuse to consider that it may have been constructed long before 2500 BC because if it was, then history is presented with a rather large gap of time between the civilization that built the complex and the civilization it has been attributed to. It is a large gap in history that cannot be readily explained without admitting that our history is wrong and that an advanced civilization existed in antiquity. That is something they wish to avoid at all cost. It is also a matter of some sensitivity for Egypt. That present they are able to say, look what our ancestors did. They built the greatest wonder on earth. It is a matter of immense pride for them and understandable why they may not wish to concede that it is not strictly true, that Egypt in fact inherited a complex from a civilization that wasn't actually theirs. But despite what academia says about the Giza complex, overwhelming evidence exists to dispute the time frame we have been given for its construction. The Sphinx is very heavily eroded with horizontal groups, punctuated by deep vertical fissures. 
Egypt's top archaeologist Dr. Zaki Hadas adamantly states that this massive amount of erosion was caused by desert wines. Now quite frankly, wine erosion is an extraordinarily strange claim to make, just in considering the history of the monument. The statue was actually buried in the sand for most of its life. It was uncovered sometime between 1417 and 1425 BC by King Thutmose IV but was soon covered again by the desert sands. It was still buried up to its neck when Napoleon arrived in 1798 and remained so until it was partially cleared again in 1817 figure 79 and still more in 1858 and 1885 figure 80. But it was not fully exposed until 1926. So there really wasn't a great deal of time for all of this wine erosion to have occurred. But even with it being covered for so long, according to estimates based the figures drive. Hadas has provided for the rate of this erosion, if it were indeed a fact, then the Sphinx should be all but gone by now, or wait for thin at the very least. There is also the disturbing fact that the deep vertical fissures are quite clearly the results of water erosion caused by prolonged exposure to precipitation. Naturally, any of these telltale fissures that appear on the actual monument are being hurriedly covered by new restoration work that is being carried out figure 81. But even with this new work, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the erosion seen on the monument was in fact, caused by water.